A pleasant day, everyone, to all the research enthusiasts and 21st century educators. Welcome to Magister Servus Research Capacity Building in Schools Using Action Research to Improve Current School Climate. I am Dr. Russell T. Soltura, Master Teacher 2 of Quezon Science High School. For today, we will discuss the different concepts behind the relevance or let's say the importance of action research among the 21st century educators, primarily our stakeholders, the 21st century learners, so that we can solve the different existing problems in our classroom setting and as in a school community as a whole. So in order for us to conceptualize the foundations of action research, we will discuss the different subtopics under this content. We have definitions of research. Number two, we will also explain the purpose and importance of action research in education for our stakeholders. Most especially, we will also explain the different parts of action research so that we can communicate well the significant findings and results in our research paper to be adopted by other school communities. Number four, we will also explain how it originated in the field of education. And finally, we will discuss the different techniques on how to identify problems in schools for action research in a scholarly way. So without any further ado, let's try to discuss the first one, definitions of research for action research. So for the basic definition, it was stated that it refers to any systematic inquiry conducted by educators in the teaching learning process. That is, inquiry, it pertains to, through the use of action research, we try to apply the different steps of scientific method. And based from our prior knowledge, scientific method consists of step-by-step -step procedure that is organized in a scholarly way. So, in other words, through action research, we can apply the different steps of scientific method just like the other types of research in which these steps of action research has something to do with the conceptual framework of action research. So to give you such idea, what do we mean by conceptual framework? And what do we mean by this systematic inquiry? So conceptual framework based from the images that we presented right now, it includes maps and compass. Conceptual framework can be compared to a map and compass. Therefore, it gives such guide and direction and it has something to do with the systematic inquiry which means that we should follow a step-by-step -step procedure we cannot follow the step-by-step -step procedure if we are not guided thanks to the conceptual framework of action research in education so in order for us to define well action research in terms of systematic inquiry let's try to discuss the specific steps of conceptual framework so that we can identify the different step-by-step -step procedures in consonance to systematic inquiry. So one of the essential parts of conceptual framework of action research in education is the first step known as diagnosing. Under diagnosing, the main highlight of the action researchers here is to identify the existing problems within the school community, specifically within the classroom setting. Of course, these existing problems must be provided with solutions. Urgent solutions must be provided so that we can experience the different benefits out of the conduct of action research. Identifying the best solution so that we can solve the root causes of such problem will be known as action planning. To reiterate once more, action planning is the part of conceptual framework in which this is the step where the teachers will now identify the best solution so that they can recall what are those possible ways for us to solve those root causes of the existing problems in our school community. Once we identify the best solution to our existing problem, that will be the time that the teachers will now implement this solution in a form of innovation or new pedagogical skills, for example. 
So application within the classroom setting refers to taking action. Taking action refers to the methodology of your study, which is the actual implementation within your school environment. And at the end of the methodology, mind you, my dear co-educators, that it will produce such result. Am I right? After the implementation of your action researches, it will produce significant results. You will now analyze and interpret data in which we have the discussion of the significant findings, whether if it is effective or not. So this will fall under the fourth step known as evaluating. So at the end of evaluating, we will now formulate the conclusion in which in this conclusion, at the same time, we will try to reflect in which the teachers should reflect whether the action researches that we conducted have weaknesses and strengths. So this step in which you will formulate conclusion is known as specifying learning. Under specifying learning, to repeat once more, it aims to, to determine the strengths and weaknesses of your innovation. And once you focus on the limitations or the weaknesses of your study, it will create another new problem to be continued by future researchers. Therefore, you will fall again to the step known as diagnosing. Therefore, the conceptual framework or the systematic inquiry approach of action research is not linear. Based from this diagram, we can say that it is an endless process simply because action research is a cyclic process. In other words, different results will generate another set of problems so that you can proceed once again to the step known as diagnosing. So therefore, under conceptual framework of action research in education, a new study can create new sets of problems eventually it can create new research studies so that is cyclic process to reiterate once more a new study will create new sets of studies simply because researches have also limitations and based from the limitations we can generate another set of problems that's why it is an endless process and every time that we conduct action research we learn a lot when it comes to data gathering procedure the process on how to reflect on it along with the methodologies so in addition to that aside from systematic inquiry Action research is defined as the process of learning by doing, in which the main proponent of this is John Dewey, one of the famous educators of all time. So action research is learning by doing because through action research, while you are doing this endeavor, you will learn the different ways on how to make such plan known as research design. You can also select the most appropriate statistical treatments or let's say thematic analysis for qualitative data. Moreover, you can determine the procedure on how to make such essential reflection for us to innovate further our pedagogical skills. So action research is learning by doing. It means that it must be collaborative. Remember with the notion that no man is an island. So in this case, action research is needed so that we can help our future researchers also in the field of education. It is collaborative, meaning to say it's a partnership among the different stakeholders. A teacher can coordinate with their school heads in which their learners are their primary respondents, which said to be the source of the data gathering procedure. In other words, we cannot conduct action research without the help of other stakeholders because these stakeholders will give us such financial support, they can provide us the data that are needed so that we can validate our conclusion based from the test of our hypothesis. Also, through action research, it is learning by doing because it is a form of self-reflective inquiry. Like we stated before, 
under specifying learning step of conceptual framework, it is reflective because through action research, a certain teacher can determine the strengths and weaknesses of the innovation that he or she conducted within the classroom setting. And through self-reflection, they can analyze carefully what are the different improvements that must be conducted further to enhance their study so that we can proceed to a successful outcome. So that is why it is learning by doing. While we are doing action research, we learn so many things when it comes to the step-by-step -step procedure of the scientific method. In other words, we can act like young scientists. Moreover, action research is persuasive. Why persuasive? Because through action research, teachers can validate. They can validate the concept of data collection the validation of data collection can lead to persuasive knowledge okay this persuasive knowledge will be used so that we can reflect about the positive outcomes with regards to the innovation and these positive outcomes will provide solution to our existing problem thus action research is persuasive okay so moreover another definition from other related literature and studies action research is relevant so to make it simpler so it is relevant because action research is an application okay application of your innovation there is an application of your innovation within the classroom setting and it is relevant because it can enhance the pedagogical skills okay of our teachers through action research they can foster a wide variety of teaching strategies in order to help further our 21st century learners so that's why action research is relevant this is the perfect avenue for the teachers to provide different new innovations in a form of new strategies in teaching that's why they can enhance their professional growth and development thus action research is relevant okay so for the last definition action research is accessible why accessible accessible simply because through research publication of your action research it can be disseminated to all different school communities worldwide once your action research is published they can adapt they can adapt the innovation that you conducted in your study in other words different school communities can borrow your concept so that they can solve also the problems that existed in their school community we can solve the same existing problem in our school community by adapting the innovation that's why it is communicated through research publication as much as possible action research must be published so that it can be shared to the different school communities worldwide and once it is communicated well they can adapt further your innovation thus it can help the problems that we shared from the very beginning so that's why it is accessible it can be adapted through the use of action research the innovations can be adapted by other researchers by other educators who have the same problems with regards to the, our school community so those are the definitions of action research it is accessible moreover it is relevant and persuasive in other words definition of action research also deals with a systematic inquiry which means that we follow a step-by-step -step procedure known as the research process or the scientific method with the guidance of conceptual framework it is a corroborative approach moreover it is a self-reflective inquiry it is an active process learning by doing so 
For our next topic, let's try to discuss the purpose or importance of action research in the field of education. So what do you think will be the main highlight of this? So it was mentioned before that the main concern of action research is to help the school community to solve the existing problems. So most of the time, there are some instances that cer certain teachers conduct action research simply because it is part of the promotion in the Department of Education. Yes, indeed, it's part of the promotion of a certain teacher for professional growth and development. However, it must be analyzed carefully that the main highlight of action research, secondary for the promotion, is to help our 21st century learners. Remember that nowadays, our country, the Philippines, is actually one of the countries who have low scores when it comes to the PISA result last time. So in other words, this existing problem or learning crisis that we experience in our country must be solved through action research. So that's why the main purpose and importance of action research, although it is being used in the promotion for teachers as part of your growth and development, is to help our school community, our stakeholders. Because remember that action research is becoming increasingly popular in education. Like what we stated before, it is increasingly popular because of the different existing problems that we encounter in our school community nowadays. That's why it is increasingly popular. So, well, again, its main purpose is that this problem must be provided with solution. But the question is, how do we provide solutions to the existing problems through action research? Through action research, it helps the educator to bridge the gap between the educational theories or the learning theories and the practice. Remember that we have several learning educational theories that we learn when we are in college degree level. For instance, the meaningful learning theory of David Osobel, the sociocultural theory of Levigotsky, the modeling ideal approach of Albert Bandura, as well as the classical conditioning theory of Ivan Pavlov, and the use of reinforcements when it comes to B.F. Skinner's idea. So these are some of the few examples of educational learning theories that we learn when we are in college degree level. However, these learning theories will serve as our guide so that we can implement we can apply these learning theories into practice. It must be implemented in our classroom setting. How do we do that? That is through action research. Remember, for us to provide solution to the existing problem, we need to bridge the gap between theory and practice. In other words, we need to apply the different contents, the different concepts and ideas of the different learning theories in our classroom setting. So for instance, once we bridge the gap, there is an application of the learning theories. And this application of our learning theories within the classroom environment will provide solution to the problem. Let me give you an example. For example, we have a certain educational theory known as the TPAC framework which stands for Technological, Pedagogical, and Content Knowledge. Under TPAC framework, according to this notion, these three ideas, technology, pedagogy, and content, must be combined together to produce effective teaching strategies. For example, let's say the content knowledge. The content knowledge refers to the mastery of the teacher when it comes to the subject matter. Can we say that the teacher is knowledgeable about the area of discipline that he or she discuss inside the class? This is known as content knowledge, the mastery of the subject matter. However, content knowledge is not enough to produce successful outcome in the learning process if the teacher don't have appropriate teaching strategies known as the pedagogical skills. The pedagogy has something to do with the teaching approach and strategies. 
For example, the use of inquiry approach, collaborative ab approach, reflective approach, etc. So in other words, pedagogical skills refers to the teaching strategies. However, these teaching strategies combined with content knowledge or mastery of the subject must of, uh, of let's say combination of the teaching strategies along with the mastery of the subject matter of the teacher must be combined with the utilization of technology or let's say the application of different softwares and other applications so that the learning will be more interactive. So in other words, if you combine technology, pedagogy, and content knowledge into one main idea or let's say one teaching strategy, it can produce positive outcomes in which it can produce long-lasting learning on the part of the students. So what's the application of the TPAC framework? Based from the experience of your speaker right now, the researcher use the context-based video instruction in enhancing the conceptual understanding in cell biology. So this is the application of the TPAC framework in which your speaker, yours truly, use video lesson. He designed numerous video lessons which are contextualized. Okay, so the use of video lessons that he created is part of technology. And then, moreover, the knowledge of the teacher in the area discipline known as cell biology refers to the content knowledge. And then, the way he discussed the lesson, the strategy on how it will be explained well in, within the video instruction is known as pedagogy. So therefore, the use of video instruction in order to deliver the different most essential learning competencies in biology with the integration of appropriate discussion method or teaching strategies is the application of the TPAC framework. So the use of video lesson was used as part of the action research of your speaker. So this is based from my personal experience that indeed action research is the application of the different learning theories in education that must be put into practice. Thus, it bridges the gap between the theory and the practice so that we can again provide solution to the existing problems simply because this action research was conducted during the pandemic times and sad to say we are aware that our learners encountered several challenges during the online class during the pandemic times so in order for the teacher to facilitate and for them to be guided the teacher created a video lesson because through video lesson he can guide the learners when it comes to the learning outcome so that they can meet the most essential learning competencies despite the fact that we have the pandemic times so this action research can help us to solve the existing problems brought by the pandemic times within the educational process. So that is the purpose and importance of action researches. And these are some of the examples of the video lessons created by the researcher in which they try to use video lessons so that it can be applied with the help of the TPAC framework, technological, pedagogical, and content knowledge. So notice that in these video lessons, the teacher deliver well the lesson, appropriate teaching strategy with the mastery of the subject content plus the use of video in consonance to technological knowledge. So lastly, the main purpose and importance of action research is to design innovations like the video instruction that was created by the teacher or by the researcher, it's part of the designing of innovation. 
along with new knowledge that will be acquired plus reflections. So through the use of action research, we can design new innovations or teaching strategies aside from the traditional method. And while you are doing while you are doing your action research, at the same time, you can gain new knowledge based from the innovation that you implemented in your classroom setting. For my personal experiences, I acquired new knowledge on how to create videos, which is out of my comfort zone. So that is an example of the acquisition of new knowledge. Through action research, you can go out to your comfort zone. Therefore, it can further develop your professionalism, your growth and development as a teacher. And finally, you can reflect about the possible outcomes of this innovation that you will implement within the classroom setting. So these are the main purpose and importance. Why is it that we need to conduct research? The bottom line is we need to help our learners. We need to help our 21st century stake holders so that we can enhance further the efficiency and the effectiveness of the educative process for the 21st century. So, likewise, through the use of reflection and new knowledge that you will acquire, it is developed for professional disposition of teachers. Simply because through action research, teachers can be lifelong learners. Since action research is an endless process, it's a cyclic process. Therefore, teachers can be classified as lifelong learners. Moreover, professional disposition because through action research, teachers can serve as a role model to our 21st century learners. That is, role model when it comes to the acquisition of new sets of knowledge since it's an endless or cyclic process. That's why it can enhance the professional disposition of teachers. So, for now, for the third part of our discussion when it comes to action research, we will now discuss the different parts of it. Because remember, writing a manuscript of action research is so essential so that we can communicate well to the public for it to be shared so that they can adapt your innovation for us to solve the problems. So for the content of action research, we have the following. Okay, so according to Wallen of 2010, this will be the formats as well as the steps of action research model. Moreover, let's try to discuss also if they are the essential parts of a research proposal or a research report. Research report refers to the final manuscript. For the parts of an action research paper, according to Wallen et al. of 2010, these are the formats, along with the corresponding step of the conceptual framework of action research model, according to Sussman of 1983. For example, introduction. The first part of action research in your manuscript is the introduction. It includes the two first steps of the conceptual framework, namely diagnosing and action planning. They are the essential parts of both research proposal and research report. So I'll repeat, in the, under introduction, we will discuss the existing problems plus the possible solution for your action research. That is under diagnosing and action planning. The next part of action research is the methodology known as method and design. And the conceptual framework step under this part is known as taking action. And method and design are one of the essential parts of research proposal and research report. Number three will be the results in which you will report the significant findings as well as the data analysis and interpretation and the third part known as results is the application of the conceptual framework step known as evaluating. Note that the results are not one of the parts of the research proposal but it's a part of the final research report. Similar with number four known as conclusion. Under conclusion, you try to summarize the findings in which the application of this conceptual framework step is known as specifying learning. 
Like the results, it is not a part of a research proposal, but it is one of the main highlights of your final research report. So these are the four significant parts of an action research. Introduction, the application of diagnosing and action planning of the conceptual framework, method and design, which is the application of taking action, results that is related to evaluating, and conclusion, which is the application of specifying learning. Note that these steps or these formats may vary depending whether you will create a research proposal or a final research report. So let's try to discuss it one by one with the use of my action research that I presented with Magister Servus in 2021, in which it won as best research paper. Designing context-based video instruction in enhancing the conceptual understanding of grade 11 students in cell biology is the title of my action research that I presented. This action research was conducted during the time of online learning during the COVID-19 pandemic since the World Health Organization announced that this gave us a negative impact also aside from health in the field of education since it offers several challenges. That's why the use of video lesson can be used as a solution to this existing problem. So for the introduction, these are the essential parts of action research under the introductory part. Number one, statement of the problem. Number two, hypothesis for quantitative research only since qualitative research is not using statistical treatments. Therefore, they just use thematic analysis. So hypothesis is only exclusive for quantitative research since it uses statistical methods to accept or to reject the hypothesis. Number three, scope and limitation. Under the introduction, it provides a discussion about the background of the research topic as well as the research guide. So through introduction, this will be the part of your action research in which you should highlight the main reason why is it that you need to conduct this study. You should highlight or emphasize the common existing problems that can be found in our world community, for instance, or even in your locality. So what is the research gap? Research gap refers to the problems that you experience in your classroom setting or within your school environment. So this is the introduction. In introduction, you will write the reasons behind, the problems behind, why is it that you need to conduct the study. And for instance, under the introductory part of my action research, notice that I try to highlight that different sectors of the government declare that different situations to see face-to-face classroom instruction for most of the learners and teachers. Since they cease to operate face-to-face -face instruction, they shifted to distance learning. However, according to the previous studies, distance learning offers several challenges. So this is my introduction. You should highlight the main reason why did you conduct the study it pertains to the problems that exist in our example distance learning offered several challenges like unstable internet connectivity there is no communication between teacher and student the facilitation of learning process is not available plus incomplete learning materials so this will be the introduction identify the research gaps or the problems that you experience which will serve as your inspiration to create your innovation after writing the introduction you will write the statement of the problem it clearly states the goals or the purposes of research it includes the different questions that you want to answer in which these questions will serve as your ultimate goal. That once you answer these research questions, we can say that you will have a successful 
implementation of your action research. So these are the problems that I want to answer in my action research. For instance, I want to assess the level of conceptual understanding of my student respondents in terms of the topics in cell biology during the first semester because I want to ensure if they have acquired learning mastery already before the implementation of the video lesson. Second, to design the context-based video instruction. Number three, to determine if there is a significant difference between pretest and poses so that I can determine whether if the innovation is valid or not. And to find out the level of acceptability of the developed context-based video instruction using these parameters. In other words, in writing your research questions or statement of the problem, it includes the different variables. Variables like learning objectives, accuracy, clarity, appeal, and usability of the video lesson, along with the scores of your pretest and post-test. So, it consists of questions that needs answer. It serves as your direction. Without research questions, your research has no direction. That must be answered. Okay? After that, we will write the hypothesis. The hypothesis presents the conjecture. Whenever we say conjecture, these are incomplete. Incomplete statements that must be tested. Incomplete in a sense that it is not yet verified. So for you to verify, to prove that it is true, hypothesis must be tested through data analysis and interpretation with the use of statistics, presentation, collection, and analysis of data. And the use of hypothesis is only exclusive for quantitative research. Unlike in qualitative research, it uses words, narratives, images for thematic analysis, for instance. So that is hypothesis. It presents the conjecture that the researchers needs to answer or to test to prove the effectiveness or the validity of the innovation. For instance, in my hypothesis, there is no significant difference between pretest and poses scores before and after using the context-based video instruction in cell biology. So this is the idea of the hypothesis in which it needs to be tested first through statistics to prove whether the use of video lesson is valid or not. After you formulate your hypothesis, you will write the scope and limitation. Keep in mind that under scope and limitation, it covers the boundaries, the coverage, and then the constraints of the study. Constraints meaning to say the weaknesses of your study that has an impact to the results of your innovation. Boundaries and coverage refers to the main focus of your study. For example, the main focus of the study is the first step Picks, or let's say the topics of cell biology during the first semester only. So this is the focus. This is the only coverage. Okay, that's why you have the term scope. Scope pertains the focus, the coverage. The coverage of this study will be the lesson for the first quarter of the first semester only. Moreover, its main focus will be the student respondents of grade 11 STEM strands only since general biology one is not offered in other strands. So that's how you write scope, the coverage, the focus, the boundary. Okay? So that will be scope and limitation. So before we proceed to the limitation, keep in mind limitation refers to the constraints. Okay, it refers to the weaknesses of the study. And this limitation can generate a new set of problem for diagnosing. For the next one, after you write the introduction of your research paper for your action research, the next one is the methodology. Keep in mind that we do not have review of related literature. You might infer that why is it that there is no review of related literature review of related literature is exclusive only for basic research for school heads because based from the 
prescribed template of the Department of Education after the introduction, it must be followed by methodology. Note that you can insert related literature under introduction also along with the results and discussion. But keep in mind that review of related literature is only exclusive for basic research, not in action research. That's why after you write introduction, you will proceed immediately to the methodology. Under action research, review of related literature will be integrated, I'll repeat, it will be integrated under introduction along with the discussion of your results. Okay? So, let's try to go back to our main content dealing with methodology. It pertains to the local of the study, research design, sample of the study, research instruments, data gathering procedure, along with the procedure, how will we analyze data. So, let's try to discuss how do we give such overview for each part of your action research. Local of the study refers to where the study is to be conducted. It refers to your school community. So, for instance, this study was conducted at Quezon Science High School. So, all you have to do is to identify or to specify the exact name of the local of your study, primarily your school. Moreover, you can also address the exact location of your school community for instance it is located in the diversion road barangay isabang tayaba city okay and all you have to do is to describe your school community Quezon science high school aims to produce students who are both academically inclined and substantially trained in the basic work skills making them globally competitive and value-oriented through relevant and responsive curriculum. So you can describe also the local of the study. Describe it briefly. So you can also describe your school community in terms of the number of enrollees. For instance, there are 446 enrollees from grade 7 to grade 12 who came from the four congressional districts of Quezon province. So that's how you write local of the study. Specify the name of the local, specify the address of the local of the study, and then describe the local which is your school community. After you specify the local of the study, the next part of your methodology is the research design. The main purpose of research design is to create the plan of the study. When I say plan, through planning, you can determine how to gather data, the procedure on how to gather data. That's why research design also provides direction to your study to answer your research question. And then this research design as a plan, it aims to control or let's say eliminate the possible threats. Threats to what? Threats to the validity. Remember that during the conduct of the study, several threats to validity can destroy the conclusion or let's say the findings of your study. So before anything else, this research design is so important because through research design, you can plan how to control or, el or eliminate totally the threats to the validity that has a negative impact to your results and discussion, producing invalid results in producing invalid conclusions. That's why research design is one of the integral parts of action research, planning on how to eliminate the threats of the validity and how will you answer your research question. For instance, the research design employed in my study is the use of one group pretest postest design. Okay, in which we don't have a control group because the main purpose of my study is to validate only the context-based video instruction. And if you want to validate only the material, there is no need for you to have control group. That's why the plan of your of the researcher here is to use one group pretest postest design. That is before the use of video instruction the 
student respondents of grade 11 will be pretested, denoted by X sub 1. After the pretest, utilization of the intervention, denoted by O, which is the treatment, known as the video based instruction. After the utilization of the context based video instruction in cell biology, at the end, we have an assumption that our learners acquired new insights about the lesson, about the learning competencies. That will be the time that it will be post-tested. So therefore, this is the symbol of one group pretest post-test design. This is my plan for me to validate the context-based video instruction. That's why we don't have control group. So this is the procedure on how to make such research design. It depends on the research question that you raised under statement of the problem. I'll repeat, the research design depends on the research question that you stated in your statement of the problem. So, you should specify the research design. The research design one group pretest post test design was specified in the manuscript. And let me give you some other research design used in qualitative. For instance, in qualitative data, if you want to assess the attitude and the behavior of an individual or group of individuals, then case study is the most appropriate. Second one, if you're dealing with the experiences, meaningful experiences of different stakeholders in your school community with regards to the problems, then the best research design for qualitative is phenomenology. Then for the culture, ethnography, and then for the next one, we have historical research to trace the different past events that can be used in order to apply it at present times for future endeavors. So these are some of the research designs under qualitative research. Moreover, for quantitative research, some popular or let's say commonly used research designs are as follows. Experimental research, that is the manipulation of the independent variable, which is your innovation, to test its effectiveness. Correlational, to measure the degree of association of two or more variables. Letter C, survey research, okay, so that they can identify what will be the perspective of the different stakeholders when it comes to the different issues and concerns experienced in the school community. And then causal comparative research design to determine the cost and effect. So these are some of the popular or commonly used research designs for both quantitative and qualitative. But take note, you can combine quantitative and qualitative research design into one aspect known as mixed methods of research so that they can strengthen further the validity of the study. There is a synergy. The weaknesses of one another can be counterbalanced by another research design under mixed methods. For instance, the weakness of qualitative can be overcome by the strength of quantitative and vice versa. So that is the concept behind mixed methods of research as one of the commonly used research designs to strengthen the validity of the study. So after you formulate the research design, after the plan, you will now describe the sample of the study. It defines the target sample. It, ha it has something to do with your respondents, the unit of analysis, okay? And it explains how participants were selected for the study. In other words, every time that you will discuss the sample of your study, you will discuss also the procedure on how will you select your respondents. This is known as sampling technique. Remember, there are two types of sampling technique. We have random sampling and non-random sampling. Random sampling, which is the scientific one, this is the sampling technique in which you give equal opportunities or chances for other respondents to be included in the study which is the opposite of non-random. There is no equal chances at all for them to be part of your current study. So you will specify 
what type of random and non-random sampling method shall be used for you to select appropriately your respondents. For instance, in my manuscript for my action research, the respondents of the study consisted of grade 11 students with a population size of 72 enrolled at Quezon Science High School. The researcher selected this group of student respondents for the said study since the concept of cell biology was prescribed within the most essential learning competencies for general biology one for senior high school offered by the Department of Education under the K-12 basic education program. The respondents were selected through the use of purposive sampling since this method will allow the researcher to select the most appropriate participants to answer the desirable research objectives. So this is one of the sampling techniques under non-random sampling, purposive sampling because general biology one is exclusive only for grade 11 students as prescribed by the Department of Education. We can say that they are the best or let's say the most appropriate participants to answer the research questions of the researcher. You will specify also the number of your samples in the given study. So that's how you write the sample of the study. Specify the respondents of the study and identify the number of respondents involved in your research. Also, state the reason for the selection of the said respondents and it has something to do with the sampling technique that you employ. After you analyze the samples of your study, the next one will be the research instruments. Remember that instrumentation plays a crucial role so that you can generate data. Without research instruments, data are impossible to collect for us to formulate valid significant results. It provides details about the instruments or specific tools used to collect data. And for instance, for the first objective, the research instrument that can be used is the achievement test in a form of pretest. And it can be used to diagnose the existing problem. The second objective, the research instrumentation can be used, is the context-based video instruction, which is the treatment. For the third objective, to answer the third objective, the research instrument is the achievement test in a form of post-test. And to answer objective number four, the researcher used questionnaire on the level of acceptability. Notice that each research objective, as much as possible, there should have corresponding research instrumentation so that they can be answered. And it must be converted in a paragraph form, like this in our presentation. For instance, we have the research instrumentation as part of the excerpt from the methodology. There are several research instruments that were used in the study to achieve such reliable and valid results and discussions which are essential for the attainment of the desirable objectives. Number one, we have the paragraph four, the first instrumentation, context-based video instruction. Afterwards, Another paragraph for the development of achievement test to answer objectives 1 and 3. And to answer objective 4, another paragraph for the development of questionnaire on the level of acceptability. Under this section, you will narrate or you will discuss briefly how did you construct each research instrument. For instance, for the achievement test, you use table of specifications. And then, it is in a multiple choice type. Discuss also the format. For example, for the questionnaire on level of acceptability, the format is in a form of Likert scale. Strongly agree, agree, disagree, and strongly disagree. Moreover, discuss its content. The questionnaire on the level of acceptability consists of sets of questions dealing with the variables, learning objectives, accuracy, clarity of the material, appeal of the material, and usability. Also, discuss how it is being validated with the help of our school heads and other experts in the field of education. Narrate the following. Number one, how did you construct your research instruments? What's the format? Number two, discuss how it is validated and how did you test its reliability. Remember, research instruments must be tested in terms of 
reliability. For instance, internal consistency using Cronbach's alpha, for example. Okay, for the Likert scale. Because unreliable research instruments will produce unreliable results that has a negative impact in our conclusion. After that, we will proceed to the data gathering procedure. You will describe the procedure and the instruments used to collect data. For example, for objective number one, this is the data gathering procedure. Okay? The data gathering procedure involved into two phases. During the first phase, the researcher administered the achievement test that was taken as the pre-test and post-test before and after the student respondents utilized the context-based video instruction respectively. The said achievement test was uploaded through learning management system that is Schoology. The said achievement test was first administered before the utilization of the said material to evaluate the prior existing knowledge of the students already possessed about the concept dealing with cell biology. The student scores were gathered since these data were used in the subsequent procedure. So all you have to do is to narrate how did you gather the procedure. Okay, so it must be discussed in a step-by-step -step manner. And that is the data gathering procedure for objective number one. Then, you should provide data gathering procedure for objective number two. And then convert it into paragraph form. Next, this will be the data gathering procedure for objective number three. Then, convert it into a paragraph form. So, this will be the data gathering procedure of objective number three. And then, finally, for objective number four, you should have another data gathering procedure. In other words, the technique is this. Every time that you will write your data gathering procedure, it must be per objective. Each research question or each research objective should have their corresponding data gathering procedure so that it will be more detailed and it can be adopted by other school communities. Okay? So, after the data gathering procedure, you will proceed to data analysis. It explains how the collected data were analyzed. For instance, under quantitative research, for you to answer objective number one, mean percentage score was used. So that is the statistical treatment that was performed by the researcher. And then you will construct a paragraph and specify its formula. Objective number two, there will be no statistical treatment since it aims to create a video instruction. However, for objective number three and objective number four, to answer these objectives, objective number three, it uses t-test for dependent sample, for instance. And objective number four, okay, under statistical treatment, all you have to do is to specify the formula for each statistical treatment. So for objective number four, weighted mean was used. So in other words, it is possible that for each objective, you have corresponding statistical treatment that is used to analyze the data, okay? However, if it is qualitative, do not use statistical treatment because it's a different genre. You will use thematic analysis. It includes coding and theming so that you can generalize the results using inductive approach under qualitative research. So that is data gathering and data analysis procedure most especially if you are dealing with quantitative research. To synthesize, restate the specific objectives and identify the statistical treatment for each specific objective. And finally, we have the last three parts of your action research, results and discussions, conclusion and recommendation. Under results and discussion, it includes visual representations of data. It includes the analysis and interpretation of data to be expressed in a paragraph form. Visual representation, meaning to say, it includes graphs and tables so that it can be conveyed easily. The communication will be effective and efficient among the readers if you will present it through graphs and graphs.
and tables. For instance, for objective number one of my action research, this will be the result under results and discussion. Mean percentage score of pretest results on the level of conceptual understanding in cell biology. Notice that based from the result, okay, the overall result is that the MPS is 31.15% which corresponds to the descriptive rating of specific misconception. It means that the students have specific misconceptions or let's say they don't have background knowledge at all under the concept of cell biology. So in order to have results and discussion, the mean percentage score of pretest results on the level of conceptual understanding in cell biology is shown in table 1. So therefore, in writing your results and discussion, the first sentence must be the title of the table. The title of the table must be converted into one sentence. And then the second part of your results and discussion, the summary of values demonstrates that the two topics, animal and plant cells, along with prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, have the highest MPS values of 79.91% and 74.51%. These MPS values fall under the descriptive rating of partial understanding. In other words, uh, for, the second, for the second part of the results and discussion, you will specify the obtained values. And this will be your analysis part. Okay? Specify the obtained values from the results. Then after you specify the specific values for the result, you will now make an interpretation. Interpret what do we mean by those numerical values of 79.91% and 